Hello, hi, I'm Ryan Doherty. I'm the curator at Contemporary Calgary, and it's a great honor today to have with us Luke Jerram, a Bristol-based artist uh, living in the UK, but uh, of international renown, who's known for many of his uh, more famous projects like Museum of the Moon, and also, of course, uh, some of his glass microbiology. So I just wanted to welcome you, Luke, to the, uh, <laughs> to the interview. <laughs> yeah, no, nice to be here. Uh, yeah, you come across very well. You're, you're a natural TV presenter. This, is, this could be a new career for you. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, so I, I thought maybe we'd just start because, you know, here in Calgary, we got to know you uh, through the Museum of the Moon project, and we're thrilled to have it up in our dome right now. It's in a gorgeous environment, and people uh, truly their jaws are dropping when they enter that dome. It's not the 30 second experience like a lot of art galleries, you know, nod and bob and move on. People are sitting down for 15, 20, 30 minutes longer, just, you know, really getting into, a, into the zone. So I wondered if you could tell us just a little bit about, you know, Museum of the Moon, its uh, origins and, and sort of where it's going. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I'm based in Bristol uh, in England and we've got like the second highest tidal range in, the, in Europe here. There's a uh probably about a 40 foot gap between high tide and low tide um and sort of cycling to work every day um i'm noticing as i cycle over a bridge this huge tidal variation uh and that got me sort of inspired in thinking about the moon and how the moon affects the tides um and i that was sort of uh, that was 15 years ago um and and then i came up with an idea of to create an artwork controlled by the moon so I, in the end, I, yeah, I used something called a gravity meter to control the water levels in these sort of glass bowls that were then spinning on tripods. And there was a, uh, like a friction device on the top of these spinning bowls that made them sing, a bit like a finger on a wine glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So as the water levels rose and fall, uh, with, it would sort of change the note and the, uh, produced in these sort of singing installation artwork so this was 15 years ago and that artwork was called tide um and it toured in fact that artwork he went to the royal ontario museum um in oh. toronto and it went to australia and, and, and toured about as a sort of acoustic kinetic artwork this installation controlled by the moon uh and whilst i was developing that idea i had this idea to create a replica moon a moon that was accurate a miniature moon as it were uh, with every valley and mountain defined in, in perfect detail. But 15 years ago, the data wasn't available uh, from NASA and the printing technology hadn't even been invented. So the artwork wasn't really possible then. Um, and so fast forward sort of, yeah, 15 years, um, an opportunity came up to, to create this thing uh, over in, I think it was Hong Kong. Um, so I pitched them the idea and they didn't like it. Uh, and then I, anyway, we managed to get support for it. Um, and it sort of came into being and it, uh, you know, I've been working as an artist for about 20 years or so. And every five or 10 years, I make something that I, that I'm surprised by. I go, Oh, this is really good. You know, <laughs> and you really, you never know until you've actually produced it, that, what the, the impact of an artwork will be. Some artworks I make and they, they, they're worse than I'd expected. Some artworks, they're kind of okay. But just now and again, you, you create something, you go, oh my God, that, now that is, this is going to fly. <laughs> so the idea I had before my moon that, that really took off was the idea of my street pianos project. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So I've installed something like 2,000 street pianos in cities around the world for people to play. And that really caught people's imagination. Um, and if you've ever seen a piano, either in an airport or a train station or across the street, you know, that originated with an idea I had sort of 10 years ago. And it's, it's become part of culture now. The idea has been copied so many times. Yeah, every, every everywhere he has one now. And exactly. How many of them are yours? Probably the, the minority now. Yeah, very, very few. So it's the nature of a good idea, you know, uh, that these, these things will have their own life and capture people as a major, and they get copied, you know, it's the nature of it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the Museum of the Moon, the moon is, is this replica moon, which is half a million times smaller than the real thing. 
and it's made of high res NASA imagery. Um, so every valley, mountain and crater is defined in perfect detail. And it provides an opportunity for the public to go around the far side of the moon as well and, and see it in, in perfect detail. Um, and it comes with a surround sound composition, so with a composer called Dan Jones, who's created this nice composition. Um, and the moon acts as this installation artwork for people to observe and hang out underneath. But it also acts as a venue for a whole series of events to take place. So have you guys uh, programmed any events under the moon? Yeah, we have had a couple already. So uh, we started off with our Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra, came in and brought uh, a quartet uh, and wow, did, nice. Oh yeah, it was beautiful, and they they did a number of uh, moon-inspired pieces from you know Moonlight good. Sonata to uh, you know Claire de Lune and things of that sort. So that was uh, sold out very quickly. <laughs> that was a great program. Uh, more recently, we had a um, a artist collective, basically a group who runs life drawing experiences. So they had. Uh, a series of like four models that were posing and all, you know, classic, you know, 30 second to 30 minute poses. Um, but at the same time, the stage underneath the moon had been built with this, you know, lamps and other things. And they were, had this band playing music, um, really sort of improvisational music with different- It sounds like a 1960s happening. This is totally, right it was a happening. <laughs> It was absolutely happening. People, there was a dancer in there moving around throughout the whole stage, and it was all the music was very trippy. And then, but to do that under the moon was, I mean, it just set the tone. Yeah, uh, yeah. People were again, it, it, people were mesmerized. So that was a really so I, yeah. Kind of so kind of what thing. I like, I like these artworks that allow that give a bit of space for the for other people to be creative. So yeah. my street piano project is a bit like that. Is it, they act, the pianos act as a blank canvas for everyone else. And the moon is also like that in that there's an opportunity for other people to be creative in their programming and, uh, and the context. The well, other thing- I, I want to add too, just before you go on that, because one of the things I've liked as well is that not everything has to be something that we're facilitating or making into a big production either. Because we've had a few people come in and be like, Let's, I just want to like go in and I want to like read some poetry and like, Oh, you want to have an event? No, no, no. I just, I don't want an event. I don't want to tell anybody. I just want to go in and read some poetry. Great. Go for it. So it's like, oh, you nice. know, things like that, that people are just wanting to have their own uh, creative encounters that don't have to be scaled into something huge. So that's, yeah, no, that's very nice. Isn't it? That's very intimate. So no, I think, I think also the artwork is quite nice in that it, it leaves space for the public to talk about their experience with one another. Yep. So it sort of becomes complete with the presence of the public. And again, I quite like those artworks that, that do that. They sort of, yeah, they become complete when, with the engagement of the public around them somehow. Um, well, this, this brings up the fact that no one goes in there without taking a photograph of themselves <laughs> or yeah. whoever they're with and posting this on Instagram and other various social media platforms or just sharing it, which I think we'll get, I want to get into a little later uh, when we're talking about things going viral. <laughs> but uh, yeah. uh, I think it's, it's, that's pretty magical. And at, at first glance, you're like, you know, we, we, might, we might scorn like, oh, it's, you know, Instagram art, but there's something very different about this work because it's like, it's really, it is creating a dialogue and it's creating this amazing yeah. connection between people and having these, I mean, these experiences underneath that moon, everyone comes out of it going like, wow, that is, um, that was uncanny. That was profound. Yeah. It's, yeah. And it's been nice. I think, uh, people have talked about how it reaches quite a broad demographic as well. Yeah. So dads taking their kids in there and, and everyone, at all different classes and areas of society going to, to see it because the moon means different things to everyone really. Um, and that's one of the reasons I created it. it this, the moon has inspired so much literature and music and mythology in every culture around the world. So if I take the moon and I, I take it to China, uh, then the moon has this great significance in terms of their mid-autumn festival and the stories around that. Whereas if I take it around India, they've got different philosophies there. If I take it to America, people instantly thought of to think about the, the Apollo moon missions and landing yeah. on the moon and all the rest of it. So there's this sort of 
cultural resonance. I'm interested in all in, in sort of uncovering and revealing all those different stories in in those different cultures. Um, and an and then if I put the moon in a put the moon in a, in a in an observatory, then it has a sort of scientific astronomical you know uh, interpretation. Whereas if we take it and put it in a cathedral, that interpretation is going to be slightly different again. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. That sort of flexible interpretation about where it goes. That's a really good point. The context changes the work so much. And I would just jump in to say like with our local, you know, indigenous populations, like grandmother moon is of great spiritual significance. So I, I could imagine like we're, our programming kind of got lopped off here at the moment, but uh, you know, we're hoping this might still reopen, but uh, having some indigenous conversations around that moon installation will also be really important. Yeah, I think that is important. And if they can come in and come and see it, and that, that's the best thing, isn't it? What, what we've noticed is whenever the moon gets presented is it doesn't really matter how well advertised it is. You get a couple of hundred people in the first day, they all take a photograph and send it to via Facebook to their friends. Yeah. And then you get 300 people the second day. And then, you know, within a week, you've got 3,000 people turning up. Yeah, and the no, audience that. numbers sort of escalate and escalate. So we've just, it was in three weeks uh, in Rochester Cathedral. Um, and Rochester's not a huge city, really. They probably have got two or 300,000 people there. But within three weeks, they had 120,000 people who'd come into the cathedral to see the moon. Wow. And, and they, those audience numbers, they repeat in every, wherever it goes. So it's always this big hit where... Um, People go again and again, and they bring their friends and family to come and see it. So it's, it's quite a phenomena. Yeah, it truly really is. And we've certainly seen uh, no shortage of attendance at our venue as well. That's good. And yeah, you're right. So it, it does, you know, has this sort of growth curve, which maybe is a good way to segue into uh, the, the next bit of topic. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> which is a little less um, celebratory, that's for sure. But yeah, so, uh, you know, we've had to close the gallery because of, you know, COVID-19 and the fact that it's a pandemic and creating a lot of situations where we need to be quarantining and isolating and having a gallery open doesn't seem prudent particularly right now. But um, it does make it rather a nice opportunity to talk about another body of work that you're quite famous for, and that's your glass microbiology, which you've been running. Well, it's, kind of, it's kind of on the opposite scale, isn't it? I'm interested it in scale. As I don't want to talk about scale. That was one of the things I definitely, like, to, to go from like your model being 500 thousandths of what the real moon is now we're going the opposite so yeah start from there yeah so um well i'm colorblind so uh that means that my paintings are really bad to begin with <laughs> um but that that, that color blindness has given me an interest in, in visual perception and about 10 years ago i was going through a newspaper reading stories, I think, about HIV at the time. And, uh, and there were often images, brightly colored images of viruses in those newspapers helping to sort of tell the story or illustrate the story of a particular virus. And I found out quite quickly that actually viruses are, are sort of smaller than the wavelength of light. So they don't really have color in the same way that we imagine them. Um, and so I, I, I worked with a virologist and a glass blower, and we made a very small little sculpture of, um, of HIV, about the size of a cricket ball. Um, and about two months later, yeah, I bumped into a curator at the Wellcome Trust, which is a big medical charity. And he said, we want to buy this for our museum. How much would you like for it? Uh, and uh and i said well you know i paid my glass blower 150 dollars to to make this thing if you can give me 150 dollars that would be amazing because it would be great to be part of your museum and he said go away and come back with a sensible offer <laughs> <laughs> which is really nice so i spoke with a curator friend of mine he said well yeah you should sell it for about maybe three thousand dollars or something like that so i did and um it's now in the museum and it kind of but it led to this whole body of work so we've been producing these glass sculptures of viruses for over 10 10 years now with uh, a sort of uh, an old, a team of old glass blowers and um they're made with scientific glassware so this isn't the sort of glass where you start off with hot glass on the end of a punty which you're spinning 
this is you start off with cold glass that you then melt and heat and fuse together and it's the same techniques you use to make distilleries and test tubes and scientific glassware that kind of thing um and 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 about eight weeks ago before the pandemic really took hold uh, a university in america they said we we want the latest um COVID-19 sculpture for, to help illustrate our research. Um, and so that got produced and it was literally finished uh, about a week ago. And, um, and I showed it to the press and then the, the imagery has just gone, it's been used as a part of helping to kind of communicate the nature of the, of the virus. Um, Sorry, so when did you start that? Like eight weeks ago, you said? Eight weeks ago, yeah. Well, this you didn't. There was no sense that it was going to be this uh, a pandemic. That, that, so. No, we didn't really know the implications of it, the global implications of the virus, sort of two months ago. Yeah. So the the artwork's got sort of more resonance now. Yeah. Uh, um, than so. it than it did, and I've got it here. Yeah, Do you let's, want to let's have a look at it. Have a look at it. There we go. Oh man, it's incredible. Yeah, it's a mad, mad looking so thing. What are we, tell, tell us what we're looking at here. Like what's, what's happening in the inside of this and what's happening on the outside of that? Yeah, so you've got the, the DNA on the inside, which is the sort of genetic code, the genetic information. Uh, and that is made out of a coil of sandblasted glass. Um, and that's held in a bubble uh, of glass and that's representing the capsid. And then on the outside, you've got all the proteins uh, of different shapes and sizes that are on the outside of the virus. And the, these um, proteins, they act as sort of keys. So when this uh, vi virus sort of touches the surface of a human cell, those keys act to unlock the surface of the cell and then the virus can enter it. And it, the, it then opens up and it uses the machinery of the human cell to replicate itself if that makes any sense yeah remarkable um and then the cell sort of explodes and sending you know millions of little viruses and other uh around the system to affect and infect other human cells and so it goes on so viruses are very strange things they they're not really living they're sort of halfway between being alive and 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 and, and not, you know, because they, they don't have the machinery of life. They use the opera, use the machinery of the human cell to replicate, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, and this is about sort of two million times larger than the real virion, if that makes sense. Yeah. Two million times. So this is even yeah. more of a scale shift than the moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so... I mean, you know, the obvious thing that comes in, I'm sure that this is a conversation that happens around your glass microbiology for... Uh, I'm going to put it down very carefully. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a topic for a very, that's come up a lot, of course, is the fact that these objects become these, I mean, they're just so delicate and beautiful. And it's about this sort of creative beauty. Uh, and then obviously that's put into contrast with the fact that these are viruses that are about death and destruction and... Um, it's a funny tension. It's a funny opposition, and I, I don't know. Yeah, it is. It is problematic. But then I'm. I feel I'm just representing these things, perhaps, as they actually are. They are these intricate, complex, mm -hmm. beautiful structures. You know, whether we like it or not. Um, what I should say is, all the money from this sculpture is going to the Maison. What is it called? The MSF Medicine Sans Frontieres. Oh, Borders. Yeah. Doctor. Yeah. That's right. That's um, wonderful. So you're you're telling you're is that up for sale right now then? Uh, well, this this one is going to the university over in uh, America who've commissioned it, but they, these things are sold in an edition of five. Ah. So there'll be another four that will get sold at some point and go to charity. Oh, that's amazing. That's very generous of you. Well, I don't know. I don't want people feeling we're ca you know cashing in on other people's misery. Yeah. It's well, just no, exactly. So with these, um, I wonder, like, I think that question of scale that came up a little bit, maybe we could dive into that a little bit more because there's something about something that's very miniature or something that's very giant that's, uh, that humans seem to get captivated by. It makes me think of like, I remember 
what a, a book I enjoyed from very many years ago, uh, Susan Stewart on longing. Did you ever, did you ever read that book? Uh, oh, he should pick it up. It's, it's called, yeah, it's on longing. And then it's, I can't remember the, the kicker line, but it's basically about narratives that develop out of miniatures and giganticism and collecting and other things. I mean, I, I'm interested in, in, and again, it's a perceptual thing about bringing objects that are beyond the human senses that are too small to be seen with the human eye and making them visible. And then things that are too large to sort of, you know, things like the moon and making it, bringing it closer by making it bigger or shrinking it down. You know, they're, they're, so it's about these extremes of scale and science does this all the time through the invention of telescopes and microscopes. We're extending the range of our senses. Um, and as an artist, I'm interested in those things as well. And color too. I mean, that's another way of, of sort of tapping into our connection to it, where they add, I, I didn't realize viruses didn't have color. I mean, that was news to me. And they, well, they paint I them up very they... beautifully. It's not even subtle. Like if they're all these like high key color contrasts and make them look very almost like our whole perception of toxicity is based on like these amazing colors that they, they adopt. They, it, yeah, it, no, and absolutely. Same, and exactly the same in space. Like we don't see the colors that are brought into many of these like nebulas and gases are all artificial too. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a funny connection. It is a funny connection. Uh, so sometimes those colors are added by scientists to help communicate particular scientific elements. And then other times um, the media, you know, journalists might say, well, we'll go for the purple and red ones because they look more dangerous and threatening. You know? So yeah. they, they, these colors have emotional impact. But there is debate, actually, I, I've been discovering about whether viruses do have colour. Uh, really? And I'm still trying to get my head around it. Yeah, I still can't quite understand it. As far as I know, they are transparent and colourless. But just because we can't see the colour, does that mean it's not there? Not that colour. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you know what I mean? There's a lot of that going. Anyway, I'll leave that to the scientists. I'll try to get my head around it. Anyway. All right, well, let me, let's wrap things up with one last question that I... I think is relevant today. And that is um, this idea of art and sort of distribution and different platforms for art to exist on. Um, and your work approaches it in many different ways. So obviously with things like the moon becoming, you know, I, I, the word feels wrong to say viral now almost, but it's really exploded around the world. Your glassware has really captured people's attention around the world. Um, and now that we're sort of finding ourselves stuck at home, we're having to, you know, engage with art in a different way. We're having to engage it in social media, online, digital platforms. And I guess I just wanted to hear your thoughts on where you think art might go uh, in this short time and in the long period that follows. And then also like how it's interesting too, that your the materials that you've used, like let's use your, your glass work. I mean, this is such a precious material that is in, in such a rare object. It's like this preciousness of this object that's only going to see so many people. And yet it exists in this digital world at the same time. There's a, an interesting contrast there too. So I, I guess, is that to say um, you need to make work that's digital? I, I, I don't think so. But I just like to hear your thoughts on this new yeah. context. I think they, they do have different... Yeah. Uh, sometimes I think that the photographs of the moon, they help to advertise it somehow to all their friends and family. And so it's, it's a sort of way to reach people. But it's not the same as actually experiencing it. As you know, just, there's, there's a very different thing between seeing a little flat square image on Instagram and then going into a room and, and being there with another, with a hundred people having this sort of shared experience. And they're very, they're very different things. And... Um, and again, with my with my virus sculptures, that's quite interesting. Is that the, the photographs of these sculptures have become part of the language of virology over the last fifteen years? So they, the photographs become used in medical and textbooks um, all the time. I was just on the phone. The reason I missed your first call was that the BBC phoned me up and they want to borrow this glass sculpture <laughs> for a television program about it in about two weeks' time. Uh, as a sort of science communication um, story for the for the public so um, yeah it's interesting what I try to do is make artwork and then it a good artwork will find its own place in the world anyway you know so the images of the viruses become part of the language of virology things you wouldn't expect you know 
whereas the moon it, it it's been yeah it's quite adaptable they they go into light festivals and science museums it's going into contemporary art centers outdoor center it can it's quite adaptable and and but i make the artwork and then it it goes, it finds its own place in the world depending on the context. So the, the glass sculptures are, they're in, um, they're in glass museums and they're in medical and science museums as well. And the glass back. collections. <laughs> and yeah, you just got to create, if, if something's really good, you push it out there and hopefully it'll find its own place. Okay, but that, let me ask you this. Do you, do you imagine yourself making a work that doesn't exist physically right now? Because you're quite, I mean, one of the things you said is that, you know, seeing these things in person is just a very different experience. And it is, like, the moon is gorgeous. I've seen many beautiful photographs, but that sense of the uncanny doesn't hit you unless you're standing right in that room with it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. now that we're suddenly finding ourselves unable to go to galleries, um, and, you know, let's, God forbid, let's imagine this is like a year where we're suddenly all locked in. Uh, artists need to still make work. Is there... Is there a place for making physical objects or should, do you think artists should be finding a way to make a work that operates in the digital um, exclusively? Well, I mean, you could, I suppose you can. The thing is, I like physical objects. There's this physicality. I think if we're all going to be trapped in our rooms, maybe we need to be thinking about small artworks that are sort of compressed and intimate, something to go inside people's houses that are, incredibly detailed maybe miniature landscapes miniature um to miniaturize everything it may be that's what we need to think about when um i've got plans to, i've got a project called the sky orchestra that involves playing music from balloons to affect people's dreams um from big hot air balloons and i've toured this around the world for mm. for about 10 years because bristol is a kind of ballooning ballooning hot air ballooning capital of europe but everyone's going to be locked down in their houses. So um, in about two weeks time, I'm planning to fly the Sky Orchestra over Bristol. So we'll have seven balloons, all with speakers attached. And then we'll be, we'll be taking off at maybe five or six in the afternoon and bathing the city in beautiful music as a sort of way to, to lift people out of their gloom and doom. Uh, so <laughs> that should be a nice project. It's called the Sky Orchestra, if anyone's interested. They can see it. We usually fly at six or seven in the morning, delivering music into people's bedrooms as they lie at home in bed. Um, is, is each balloon a different instrument or they're all playing it and spread out over the city? Yeah, each, usually the Sky Orchestra, yeah, each balloon has a different part of the musical score. Right. We take off from one location and then we gradually spread out. So it's a bit like whales calling. You can have these different balloons with a call and response creating this huge surround sound effect, delivering, projecting this music into the empty streets. Um, and we, it's a, it's a nice project that we've taught. It's quite logistically complicated a lot of the time. But, but we'll yeah. be doing it in Bristol as a way to sort of uh, connect people um, together with, with music. And given, given, you know, given the fact that the streets will be empty, everyone will be trapped in their houses, it would be a nice thing to do. It's lovely, and what a, what a lovely way to end this conversation because it's like, it's this optimism and this hope and this humanity that still comes out in people in times of crisis. And you're seeing that, I mean, with the music, you imagine uh, the singing spontaneously in Italy that happened, which is so beautiful. And, and now we're seeing it uh, in Montreal, singing Leonard Cohen songs, and you're seeing it online with musicians just like offering free concerts online. And this is yeah. like music has been, a, an art has been a great way of bringing humanity together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's there's a real sense of um, shared common values, I suppose, and a common sort of spirit and people wanting to share creative ideas as a way and solutions and things like that. So at the moment, just this weekend, all the kids are drawing beautiful rainbows and they're putting them on their windows. You know, the stars, all, kids all around the country in England are doing that. And, um, and then on, tomorrow, I think it is at five o'clock, we, there's been a call for everyone to go to the front door of their house and give a round of applause for all the um, the NHS health and nurses and doctors. So there'll be sort of 60 million people coming to the front door and giving a round of applause. Uh, uh, for people. That's so deserved, but uh, yeah, beautiful. That's just beautiful. So there's, there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of that. You'll, you'll see that 
Because I think you're a couple of weeks behind right? us, aren't you? Basically, where you are. Yeah, we're a bit behind, but that's. I think that those things are bound to be coming here too. Um, yeah, but you'll you'll have all the good stuff, but you're you're also going to have all the bad stuff as well. People sort of panic buying a little bit, oh, and that, that's uh, starting in a big way. Yeah, again, the, yeah. the toilet paper has disappeared. Uh, that's a it's a funny one, but it's gone. Mm. <laughs> Anyways, anyway, uh, we'll leave it at that, Luke. That's been. We'll leave it at that. It's lovely to be here, and uh, very nice to talk with you. I hope this was interesting and informal. I think it was. It was delight <laughs> delightful, and uh, I look forward to chatting with you again soon. And best of luck with all your projects. And uh, thanks. And I hope the Museum of the Moon gets a, a new life here uh, at Contemporary Calgary before uh, not too long. Yeah, I hope so too. And we've got an Earth artwork as well, which was yeah, turns, Gaia. yeah. So maybe we'll send that to you sometime soon as well. That'd be a nice follow-up. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, good. take care. Good luck. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye.